To help answer these questions, Unsolved History has assembled a team of investigators and experts. Historian Daniel Martinez. Retired aviation investigator Ron Schleed. Author and former NASA engineer Jim Oberg. Retired 747 pilot Hal Ewing. Russian aviation investigator Vladimir Kofman. Former Soviet Air Force General Anatoly Kornikov. And Russian journalist Andrei Ilyesh. Also, we'll hear a moment by moment account of the tragedy by the man who actually shot down KAL 007, fighter pilot Lieutenant Colonel Gennady Osipovich. In 1983, tensions between the United States and the USSR were high. American President Ronald Reagan had called the Soviet Union the evil empire five months earlier, and the superpowers were engaged in a dangerous game of brinksmanship. On September the 1st, the game turned deadly. After stopping to refuel, Korean Airlines Flight 007 departed Anchorage, Alaska at 4 a.m. It was the second leg of its flight from New York to Seoul. The shortest route would have taken the jet over Soviet territory. The Cold War tensions were high, so commercial airliners routinely stayed outside the borders of the USSR. Ten minutes after leaving Anchorage, KAL 007 started drifting off course. One hour and 20 minutes later, the plane was no longer in contact with Alaska's air traffic control and even further off its flight path. It was heading straight for the Kamchatka Peninsula and out of range of any of the North Pacific radio beacons. KAL 007 had missed its last American checkpoint at Bethel, Alaska. After it passed Bethel, which it missed by only 12 miles, not really enough to give the radar controllers, even had they been watching, much of a heads up. There are no more beacons on the entire North Pacific route until you get to Japan. The Kamchatka Peninsula was home to several key Soviet military installations. As the Korean airliner approached Kamchatka, Soviet air defense ordered fighter jets to approach and observe it. 32 minutes later, Flight 007 had crossed the peninsula and re-entered international airspace. Soviet air defense tracked the plane as it continued on a southwest heading. Apparently unaware that they were off course, KAL 007's cockpit crew continued to make weather and progress reports to air traffic controllers in both Anchorage and Tokyo. The passengers on that airplane, even the crew, in all probability, weren't even aware that they had ever violated Soviet airspace. Soon, 007 approached Sakhalin Island, where once again it would enter Soviet airspace. Soviet Defense Command ordered MiG-23 and Su-15 interceptors into the air. For 20 minutes, the fighters shadowed the Korean 747. The Soviets had launched aircraft out to meet the intruder, came around behind it, and followed it across the island. At 6.15 p.m. local time, the 747 pilot requested permission to climb to 10,700 meters. Three minutes after that, Su-15 pilot Lieutenant Colonel Gennady Osipovich received orders to destroy the aircraft. Osipovich fired his two missiles, each bearing 32 kilos of high explosives, and reported to ground control that the target was destroyed. It took 12 minutes for the crippled aeroplane to spiral 10,700 meters to Earth. KAL 007 crashed into the Sea of Okhotsk, just north of Monoran Island, 
350 nautical miles off course. Why had the plane strayed so far off its flight path? The Korean pilot and crew were very experienced, and they'd flown the Anchorage to Seoul route many times before. How could they fly like this? How could an experienced pilot really ignore his navigation? This remains a mystery. Lawyer Juanita Madola represented the families of the victims of KAL 007. The claim was uh, negligence on the part of the cockpit crew, that they had devices in the cockpit that would have let them know that they were off course in terms of coordinates and also that they were over land when they should have been over the water. So our argument was that they were totally oblivious to where they were and didn't care, or they knew that they were off course but were trying to fumble their way across the Pacific anyway. To try and get some insight into the matter, retired 747 pilot Hal Ewing and historian Daniel Martinez have come to the Flight Training Academy in Miami, Florida. Ewing has been studying the crash of KAL 007 for over 20 years. Using combined data from the black boxes and a 1993 report by the International Civil Aviation Organization, he will mimic the flight of KAL 007 in a state-of-the-art flight simulator from the time it took off until it crashed into the sea. and make the same turns that they made at the same time that they made. The simulator here has been set to the same weight, the same center of gravity, the same weather conditions, the trim is the same. To the maximum of our ability, everything is the same as it was that night. Okay. Like most commercial airliners at the time, the 747 depended upon an inertial navigation system, or INS. This guided the plane using a series of ground-based radio beacons. The route the aircraft was supposed to fly was R-20, which is an airway. And R-20 has certain waypoints along the way that are entered in to the inertial navigation system. And the inertial navigation system, when it's linked to the autopilot, will then fly the aircraft to each of these waypoints. But this system wasn't automatic. The pilot needed to switch the aircraft to the INS mode manually. When it reached a certain location, the autopilot should have been linked to the inertial navigation system, which would have taken the aircraft on a route that would have kept it out of Soviet airspace. But on the 1st of September 1983, the INS was not engaged. For some reason, the switch was in all probability never moved from heading to INS to actually engage the INS system. Clearly, something distracted them at the crucial moment, caused them to simply forget to move the switch from heading to INS, and then they never caught the error for the remaining five hours of flight. One of the central questions that the general public has had about this incident since it happened is, how could someone not have seen what was going on? Why didn't ground control see that the flight was off course? Why didn't somebody warn KL-007 that, that it was about to stray into the Soviet Union? The answer is right here. These are all the sites that existed in 1983 that could have seen Korean Air 007 on radar as it headed off to the west toward Seoul. It began to deviate from its desired track almost immediately after takeoff. A direct track from where it was at that moment to Bethel is not depicted on the chart, and it's not depicted on the radar scope of the controller. So there was really no way for the controller to know whether the flight was proceeding at any given moment direct to Bethel or not, simply by looking at his radar scope. Now, we have radars, that, even at that time, that could reach out thousands of miles in space and track an object. Why couldn't that track KL? The problem is they're usually large, very powerful phased array radars, and they're designed to look at space. They're not designed to look at things close to the surface of the Earth. So because of their antenna position and because of the fact that the Earth is round, KL-007 was simply underneath their radar horizon almost all the time. Now, as you can see from the chart here, when KL-007 started getting seriously off course, 
and beginning to penetrate Soviet airspace way over here. It's out of the radar. He was miles, hundreds, thousands of miles out of the range of any Western radar. The Russians had radar and the Russians saw them, but they used their radar for another purpose. That purpose was defense. The Soviets diligently monitored each and every airplane that flew into its restricted airspace. Russian journalist Andrei Ilyish believes that a manned American radar station had seen KAL-007 veer off course early on, but did not pass the information along. The radar controller's voice is constantly recorded, and one said to the other, contact them, who knows where the hell they are going? The researcher came to the point where they told him this has been erased, and that's that. And that's all bull, because the next morning the President of the United States announces the Soviet Union as an evil empire. This was pretty well prepared, and in that case nobody would have been erasing anything. This is all military deceit. In fact, the evil empire line had come five months earlier. And there is no concrete evidence to indicate that anyone in America knew about the plane having strayed into Soviet territory. While US radar did track the aircraft as long as it remained in range, that information was recorded, but not actively monitored. And during that time, it did show the gradual deviation north of the intended track. However, at that time, there were no procedures in place for a person to monitor the radar to watch for such a deviation. But there's no evidence, and never has been, to suggest that any civil radar, that any air traffic controller would have been looking at on that night had the capability to warn KAL-007 that it was proceeding off course. And it wasn't just a radar problem. Several other events contributed to the tragedy. There were other planes in the immediate area that evening. Another Korean Airlines flight. And 120 kilometers away, an American spy plane. This plane, an RC-135, was monitoring secret Soviet missile tests. The RC-135 is a converted Boeing 707, which has a similar shape to a 747. These American spy planes flew in and out of Soviet airspace, intercepting communications and collecting data. The Soviets knew all about these kinds of missions because they were routine, they'd been flown many times, and Soviet pilots had scrambled to actually chase down and often wave to some of these aircraft. Passenger airlines had been warned that intrusion into Soviet territory could result in a possible attack. The whole area was militarized. So to have an airliner coming across this area even by accident, set them up for this disaster. And because of the cat and mouse game being played between America and the USSR, the danger was particularly high. It was uh, common practice in those days for the US uh, to use RC-135s to tease the Soviets, mocking that they were going to uh, penetrate their territory. They would fly toward their territory, and uh, the Soviets would bring up their radars and send up fighters, and then the RC-135s would turn around. As KAL-007 neared Soviet airspace, its flight path began to converge with that of the RC-135. The Soviets were watching the aircraft on their radar.